We hope the purpose of the trip is to wrap up the whole educational package that we've had at Christian Heritage. We hope for the students to be able to understand at really much a, a deeper level who they are as Christians, and who they are as Americans, and their responsibilities in that. What we hope is that by coming on the trip that they uh, want to maintain that and understand who they are and maintain who they are and be able to help propagate the gospel and to help restore the nation. That is our uh, stated purpose as a school and that's what we hope this trip ends up doing, helping them. Your view of history makes all the difference. If your view of history says that somehow events are random things that happen, uh, then it's not going to matter. The, the, this trip really can't mean much. George Orwell said, he who controls the past controls the future. Meaning your view of history makes huge difference in how you respond, what you do. Karl Marx said, a people without a heritage are easily persuaded. Meaning if you don't understand who you are and where you came from, wow, you can be persuaded of anything, to do almost anything. All you have to do is change your history. And all we, you have to do is look back in history and, and they've changed the history of a nation and changed what they taught. And just in a few generations, it's changed. What's happened to us here? in America, many of those things have happened because we've changed our history. We've forgotten that it's about God. It's important that they remember their history because God said, don't forget the ancient landmarks. Remember your heritage. Uh, remember what I have done. It's not about what man has done. It's not what man accomplished, but it's what God has done through those men and in our nation. When we remember, then we understand purpose. If we don't remember, then we lose focus. This location is, as aptly named, First Landing Beach because it was right out in there where, and we'll see it better from Pilgrim Monument, so they came all around the Little Cape and then came inside where it was protected and landed right out there. This is where they probably caught a lot of the colds and things that they had because they were drenched, it was wet, it was cold. They came here, they saw a bunch of sand, but they also were so glad to see the land. This was where Bradford's wife, I mean, it was literally right there where she fell overboard. Uh, one of the things I like to point out here, one of the classes for their class gift, put a stone here. First landing, I mean, really right here. They stumbled ashore and did their first washing uh, on a Monday. Uh, and that's why wash days on Monday still yet. And started the great adventure of developing a nation right at this point. You look at this and you say, well, it's just nothing. But it was everything. They needed fresh water bad. And there's no fresh water out here. They had ran out of water. They were looking around. They needed water bad. How did they find this? How did they find it? I think it was God's provision for them. And again, you can look at it any way you want. Well, they just happened on it. No, God had a plan to have a nation that would have the liberties to be able to spread the gospel. That's what I believe, and that's what a story of history tells you. It was here on one of their discoveries, they called them, and they were roaming around looking mainly to find if there was any Indians, and, and they came upon this cache of corn, and it was buried up in a hill, and it was underneath some sand and brush and stuff, and they found the corn. And they were very conflicted about what to do. They certainly didn't want to make anybody mad uh, for taking their corn, 
But at the same time, they looked at the soil around here and said, the corn that we brought is not gonna work. We're starving and we just got here and now we found this and we will pay it back. And they did and they spoke with the Indians and they paid all that stuff back. What are the chances that they come across some corn that is just randomly here? It is a mark, if you will, of God's provision that he wanted them here. He was protecting them. He had a reason that for this nation to become all that he wanted it to be. And mainly that was about the spreading of the gospel. I really think the goal of the trip is just to get you fully immersed in the whole experience of understanding our American Christian heritage. At CHA, we've been talking for so long about these things, the pilgrims or the American Revolution, whatever it is, and the Christian principles behind it. And this trip finally gives you the chance to actually see where all those things occurred and really get a full understanding of it. So it's been great to be out here and just see all of it and finally get to see where all this history happened and what makes us have an American Christian Republic. the Mayflower Compact. You can see that there, the women giving witness and the men signing the document. They signed it before they came on land. That document served as the sea for our Constitution. It was a document that was a seed of a representative form of government. It was a seed that grew. It grew to Thomas Hooker's Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. It grew to Massachusetts Body of Liberties. It grew to the Declaration of Independence and finally the Constitution of the United States. Where did it start? It started right here with the people who had been prepared by God for a particular purpose. These people had been from England to Holland had been betrayed, had been in jail, uh, their possessions taken, had sold all their stuff, had some of them left their children there. Brewster had to hide to get on the Mayflower. It was not just the quiet little band of church going people. I mean, these people were great adventurers and they have all sorts of struggles getting over a 20 day journey or so that takes 60 days. There's trapped down in the bottom, it's cold, it's wet, there's no place to do anything private. Ladies trying to give birth to babies and eating this hardtack stuff. I had some once and it was like terrible. They were all sick, the sailors made fun of them. All these things were going on. They finally get the province down, they, you know, they get across here, more die. We've got a group of what, maybe 40? Just think about doubling, tripling this group and being down in that hole, okay? It would be terrible. Do you remember how they came around Cape Cod, landed at Provincetown? It wasn't a good place to stay. They sailed on down the Cape. They encountered some Indians. They had a skirmish with them, but no one was hurt. They came around the Cape and they came to this place. This place had been abandoned. Why? Well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, there was a disease. And number two, there had been a, a comet or something to go by and it scared the Indians away from here. They came here, they found fresh water, they found cleared land. It was just the perfect place. That first winter, half of them died. They buried the pilgrims right here on this hill that we're standing on because they didn't want the Indians to know that they were dying off. But later in the spring, an Indian by the name of Samoset walks into their camp. He asked them for something to drink. And after talking with them, Samoset knew his limited skills of communication and so he goes back and he gets an Indian called Squanto. He became the mediator between Massasoit and the Pilgrims. Later that month they signed a treaty in 1621. They held a Thanksgiving feast. There were 90 Wampanoag Indians that came to the feast. 
Later on in 1623, Massasoit becomes deathly ill. Dr. Fuller and Winslow helped Massasoit they took some juice of some type that they had made. They put it on his tongue. He was able to swallow. He was able to respond and he was healed. He said at that time, he said, now I see that the English are my friends and they love me. And while I live, I will never forget this kindness they have shown me. I've spent about 10 years of my life learning about everything on this trip. So because I have all of that knowledge before I've been on this trip, it's really helped make it very personal to me. Everything that I've learned, I'm seeing. Everything that's been invested in my life to learn, to use, I'm seeing it and it's become very personal to me. And so because now it is very personal to me, it makes me see the need to preserve it and keep it protected. Bradford, of course, you know the story. I'll just tell it really briefly. He was a young man who uh, was sickly at uh, age seven. He was actually orphaned and went to live with his uh, uncles. And he spent over a year uh, in bed. At some point, a young man asked him to go to church. And at that point, actually, Bradford was saved and decided that the Church of England was teaching the wrong things as they looked at the scriptures. So at some point, Brewster took him in, gave him counsel, gave him even a home for a while. Bradford came over on the Mayflower as one of the prominent men. Then he also wrote the history. He kept a journal of all those things, and now we know that as Plymouth Plantation. Pilgrims did something strange, and that was they brought their wives and their families and their children. It was a bit crazy, but they did it. They knew it was going to be difficult. They knew it was going to be hard, yet they brought their mothers. They brought their families with them because it was a family thing. They came for their families. Well, I thought they came to proclaim the gospel. Yes, but it was mainly for their families. They wanted to have a place where their families could be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There were 29 women, half of them perished the first year. They died because, and it's, it's illustrated in the writings, it says several times, so-and-so gave her coat to her child or gave her coat to someone else. Very self-sacrificing, but it is something that we should give honor to. And that's what they were trying to do with this statue, was give honor to the mothers who came. And you can see, just like always, what does she have in her hand? She's got a Bible. It was big. It was what they believed in. It was what they put their faith in. And she was honoring the Lord in that way. This is called the Ginny Grist Mill. And it's another one of the things that you had to have to have a settlement. All the meal, all the corn, everything could be milled right there. Soon after the pilgrims came, they started this grist mill. But don't miss the, uh, the fish ladder. See the fish ladder? Again, something that was needed. Believe it or not, the fields that were here were very much overused because it was very hard to clear the land. And so with the part that they cleared, the Native Americans had used the soil up. So what did you need once you used the soil up? Fertilizer, exactly. Squanto comes along and teaches them how to do that with the herring. The herring go up this like the salmon. And so they do that. Some years we're here, they're jumping. I don't see any jumping today. But anyway, that's how they get up the stream. The trip's impacted me spiritually, just learning about all of our heritage, coming back to its roots, getting to, hearing about it for so many years and finally getting to see it come together. It just hits home. It's good to see what God did for us providentially, spiritually, with Separatists, and Pilgrims, and all the sites. It's good to see what God did for our nation starting out here. This is the largest solid granite 
monument in America. It's 81 feet tall. Faith is 29 feet tall. Her finger is two feet long and it has a tremendous amount of meaning to it. It was designed by a man whose name was Hammett Billings and it was finished in 1889. It is called the Faith Monument. And you can see that very simply because it has faith at the top of it. There are four things about faith that I want you to notice. Okay, first of all, in her left hand, you'll find a Bible and the pages are ruffled. It's called an open Bible. And it depicts for us the Bible that the pilgrims brought with them from England. The Geneva Bible. They brought it because number one, it was small. Number two, it was inexpensive. And number three, it had a characteristic which no other Bible before that time had had. And that is it was divided into chapter and verse, okay? And it had explanatory notes with it. Okay, those notes talked about liberty. And the King of England did not like the Geneva Bible. The next thing that you'll notice is that she has a raised forefinger pointing toward heaven. That's because the pilgrims believed that there was only one way to heaven, and that was through Jesus Christ alone. The next thing that you'll notice, the star on the forehead represented the intellectual faith of the pilgrims, okay? The separatists believed that the scripture should be applied to every area of life. And so they believed that you could reason from scripture, and from scripture itself, you could uh, determine how to live. The fourth thing that you will see about faith is that she's stepping on a rock. She's facing the east from whence she had come from England and she was stepping out in faith on Plymouth Rock. Okay, and that depicts the call of God that they believed that they had to come to this land to propagate the gospel, to establish a colony where they could worship and serve God freely, where they could own property, where they could enjoy the fruits of their labor, and they could live in harmony with one another. The character of the separatist was that of moral excellence or of morality. On each side of morality, you will see a prophet on the other side, you will see an evangelist. The prophet represents the Old Testament and the call of God that a prophet had. He's looking up toward heaven, he's receiving his call from God, and he would declare the truth. When you look at the evangelist on the other side, you will see someone sowing seed. Why? Because they were sharing the gospel wherever they went. The Alta Relief is the pilgrims leaving England to go to Holland to find a land where they could worship and serve God freely according to the teachings of the scripture. You'll notice that morality has in her left hand a copy of the Ten Commandments. Also, in her right hand, she's holding a scroll of Revelation. They felt called of God to leave England and to go to Holland where they hoped they would gain that freedom they were looking for. Eventually they will understand that they didn't have that in Holland and they will eventually come to America. Law is the one that is vandalized the most. If you could see, first of all, in the left hand once again, we have the Ten Commandments. That is the law. If the hand were not broken, you would see the hand reaching out in mercy. There is a balance, they believed, between law and mercy. Very piercing eyes of the law. It's very black and white. It's very true. They believed that all men were equal and should receive no special treatment. Upholding the law was the foundation for their relationships with other people and with one another. But they balanced justice with mercy and had the reputation of being the most tolerant people of their day. What we have is the alto relief here is the signing of the peace treaty with the Indians. That was the only treaty that was ever fully kept with the Indians in America. They had a balance of justice and mercy that was especially demonstrated in their relations with Squanto. Because Squanto sometimes would play the Indians against the pilgrims and then the pilgrims against the Indians. And Massasoit, he even wanted Squanto killed and Bradford said, no, he's been a gift to God for us. And so they dealt with justice, they dealt with mercy. Education was extremely important 
to the separatists, to the pilgrims. You'll see here that she is holding a book and she's pointing to it. And on each side we have wisdom. They believe that wisdom was gained from a study of the scripture. And they had an absolute respect for their parents. Okay, they taught obedience and respect to their children. On the other side, we have youth. Youth that is led by experience. And you'll see the mother holding the hand of the child and leading them. They felt that it was the mother's responsibility, that it was the, the father's responsibility to lead the children in the way they should go. The altar relief is the signing of the Mayflower Compact. Their pastor, John Robinson, had written them a letter before they left Holland. He outlined for them principles of civil government that if for some reason they were not able to be under the charter in Virginia, that they would have something by which they could form their own form of civil government. Later on, the King of England did not accept the validity of the Mayflower Compact, and he wrote a document a year later called the Pierce Patent. And the Pilgrims said, no, thank you. We can what? Govern ourselves. Liberty is the strongest of the statutes. We have a man dressed in typical Roman armor. He has broken chains around him. He is free. The lion has been slain. The sword is in a sheath. This is a symbol that says that peace comes through strength. The slain lion that he's setting on says that he has won a great victory. They wanted to overthrow the tyranny they experienced in England through the peace of their religion. They felt as though they were in a war against tyranny. The war is symbolized by the armor. The tyranny is symbolized by the lion and bondage. Okay, they felt like they were in bondage and that was symbolized by the chains. What we have here in the alto relief is the landing of the pilgrims on Plymouth Rock. It was the fulfillment of what they had begun to do. In closing, I want to read you from Daniel Webster. Let us not forget the religious character of our origin. Our fathers were brought here by their high veneration for the Christian religion. They journeyed by its light and labored in its hope. They sought to incorporate its principles with the elements of their society and to diffuse its influence through all their institutions, civil, political, and literary. I would venture to say to you and challenge you that it takes more courage to do that than to live after your own desires. From this trip, I personally have learned so much more about how America was founded as a Christian nation. I would talk about it all the time at school, but I didn't even realize it until we see, like we went to the Adams house and saw how his most prized books were either Bibles or something written about the Bible. And all the founding fathers really had a deep, deep relationship with God. And these cities even, Salem, Boston, which is sad, a lot of them now are really far away from God and everything they do and their views. But they were all founded with the aim to glorify God and to create a nation where you have liberty and you can glorify the Lord, worship Him in any way. But it's still a Christian nation, no matter what people might try and tell you now. This is the Mathers burying ground, which is kind of odd. There's not much to it here. As you see, it's not very well thought of. George Washington said that they were the true founding fathers of America. They were some of the greatest writers, scholars, and preachers in American history. And it's kind of odd how it all started. John Cotton died, and Richard Mather's wife died, and the two married each other and became the Mathers. Increase actually later married his half-sister, nice. which is okay, it wasn't his sister, and they called their son's name 
Cotton, right, Cotton Mather. Let me tell you just a little bit about each of them. Increase was taught several languages by his father, and then he decided to go to England to school. But when Charles II took the throne, he said, I'm not staying under this tyranny. He came to America and became known as the greatest American Puritan. He served at Old North Church for over 50 years, and he published over 80 books and hundreds of papers that influenced the culture of New England. Cotton, his son, was a great evangelist at his dad's church. He wrote and published over 400 books. They influenced the model of law for the colonies. Cotton was interested in a myriad of things. He is famous for supporting the witch trials, but he was also critical in stopping them. He set the stage for the Great Awakening in America. Cotton's son, Samuel, comes along, and he was a great preacher in his own right, and he spoke to the state legislature numerous times, imploring them not to forget what their ancestors had done for them. It's evident that the Mathers don't get much recognition. These guys made a huge difference. The books they wrote, the things that they did, the influence that they had on culture. We had to have a generation of change, not just somebody that was going to talk or, or do a few things, but really make a change. How does that happen? They had parents who diligently taught them. And this is whose grave? Josiah Franklin. Josiah Franklin. It's his parents. Benjamin Franklin uh, was raised here in Boston, but they moved, of course, to Philadelphia. But his parents uh, lived here for a while, and so they were buried here. And Franklin put this monument up to them, Franklin himself. He was the youngest child. He really showed no evidence uh, of ever becoming a Christian or accepting the faith of his parents. It doesn't appear that he did, but he did have a very Christian worldview from his parents. He used more biblical references than any of the founding fathers, yet believed he was probably a deist and didn't really believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He even called the assemblies to prayer numerous times when prayer was needed. When it looked like the Constitution wasn't going to be ratified, it wasn't going to be put through, he said, we should be praying about this. So that's the first aspect. Samuel Adams was a fiery person. He liked to get people fired up, but he wasn't much of a speaker. He was rather a poor person, but he could write, and he was good at it, and he fired people up. And him and Hancock, who's buried right over there, they would go around together. And he was the one who started and proposed the Committees of Correspondence and promoted the principles of liberty throughout the colonies. Governor Gage thought that he could corrupt Adams with money. He told him if Adams would make peace with the king, that he would be well rewarded. Sam Adams was at that point a wanted man. The first ingredient that you really need for a generation of change is parents, of course. You really need godly parents that have raised their children up properly. The second one you need is the power of the spoken word. Now, in the north, the power of the spoken word was James Otis. In the south, it was Patrick Henry. He was born in 1725 on Cape Cod when he was 18. He graduated from Harvard. He was very conservative. He was very loyal to the king. He thought this whole revolution thing was just wrong. He did not like it. Until a group of Boston people, they said, would you look at the writs of assistance? He started looking at it and he decided that this is wrong. And so he switched sides. Adams wrote 50 years later, it was then and there that the child independence was born. Otis is now seen as the father of constitutional law in the United States and the father of the Fourth Amendment. So, you need parents, you need spoken word, you need written word. The fourth aspect, money. then you have to have what? Money. You gotta have money. Money for all sorts of things. Every change, something that's lasting change, you have to have support, you have to have money. Hancock was that. He was a brilliant young man. He graduated from Harvard at 17. He was sent to England at 18 as an ambassador, and after his uncle died when he was 27, 
he became the richest man in Boston. In 1768, one of his own ships was seized and his property taken, set off numerous riots around town. And he said, anarchy and riot will only bring greater tyranny. Most of the supporters of the revolution lost their fortunes in this cause. We needed the families, we needed the spoken word, the written word, we needed finance, and then we need somebody of courage. We need a lot of people of courage, like Paul Revere. He was more than that one ride. He was a member of the Committee of Safety. He had 16 children with two wives. He was an engraver and a silversmith, and many you see many things around here. It was his engraving of the Boston Massacre that incited people. He was one of those that participated in the Boston Tea Party. So, if you're gonna have a revolution, a change of something, you need those aspects. You need godly people with godly parents to have a good foundation, a, a good worldview, and the power of the written word and the spoken word and some money, and then people who will get out there and do something. One thing that really stood out to me like over this entire trip has definitely been like um, how one person or just like a group of a few people can make such a big difference and that's definitely something that I'm going to like take to heart not only in my life but I'm going to tell my kids that and make sure they are wanting to carry that on and make a name for themselves not just for their glorification but for God's because there's, there's a lot of things that can be changed about you know the world around us. Boston Latin School. This was the first public school in America. They were much more Christian than we ever think about being. Just many of the ways they did things were uh, tremendous. They started public schools so they could have the character and morals to maintain a republic. And that's why they started it. But it kind of fell apart at some point. And again, it was here that it fell apart because of John Dewey and and those people wanted free, more freedom. And okay, that, too much freedom uh, takes you too far sometimes. Anyway, there's still a Boston Latin School uh, that you can get into. A little hard to get into now, but you can. This is the old state house built in 1713 one of the oldest public buildings still standing in the United States. It was the seat of British government. They built it to house the British government. It was in the state house there that liberty was born, they say. It was from the balcony here that a few days after uh, July 4th, 1776, they read the Declaration of Independence to the people for the first time. Also what happened here was the Boston Massacre. And you've heard about that. It was very much overplayed. It was some teenage boys causing trouble, throwing some snowballs with rocks in them. And some young soldiers who really didn't know what they were doing. And finally, somebody fired and killed several. But that was the uh, Boston Massacre site. It was much overplayed. Paul Revere did that. A lot of propaganda, if you will, to get support for the revolution, and it did happen. If you could imagine back to 1640, a modest home was built right on that spot. It was the parsonage of the Second Church of Boston, and that's where the pastor lived. Increase Mather was the pastor of the second church and his son Cotton also lived there. In 1676, Boston had another fire and the fires were just terrible. Of course, all the houses were made of wood, they couldn't get water. And so when the fire started, it burned down just whole blocks of places. The town leaders bought what they called a pumper box from London and that was the first hired firefighters in America. A much nicer home was built here in 1680, which makes this the oldest building in Boston. 90% of what you see there 
is original. Paul Revere moved here in 1770 and stayed here for 10 turbulent years until 1780. They were gonna tear it down and Paul Revere's grandson decided he would purchase it and opened it as one of America's first historic homes. So it's been open for a long time. It's definitely something that will put in perspective everything that you've learned and really make it interesting because sometimes you can get so textbook to where you're like, I have to learn something else, this is ridiculous, I can't believe we're learning this, what does this even mean? And then actually seeing it and putting it in a perspective and getting to see it all together and you're like, wow, this is really where things started. the Lexington Minuteman statue. It was put here in 1900. It is John Parker. John Parker commanded the militia that was here on April 19th, 1775. He was born in Lexington. He was in very poor health at the time. He had tuberculosis. He died about two months after this time. It was his order, stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they wanna have a war, Let's have it here. Of course, the British heard that there were stores of ammunition here in Concord. They were trying everything they could to keep down this rebellion. And they also knew that Sam Adams and John Hancock were here and they were staying down the street at John Hancock's cousin's house. They wanted them. They were gonna pardon almost everybody except Hancock and Adams. They wanted, because they were the rebel rousers of the whole group. But what they didn't know was at that point, they were coming sort of behind enemy lines, if you will. And although there were just a few people down here, they were in great trouble at that point. This is the side of the meeting house where they had their church. Jonas Clark was repaired during the Great Awakening. He was a young 25-year-old pastor when he came here, and he was preparing them for what was going to happen, although he didn't know it. Uh, Jonas Clark's wife was the cousin to John Hancock. John Hancock had come. He had brought his friend Sam Adams here, and of course they were very much wanted by the British government. They ride out here and they tell them, they tell the Minutemen, the Minutemen come down there, they ring the bell and people come. About 80 came actually, about 2.30 in the morning down here and it's like, well they're coming and so they were all excited but they're several hours away. Okay fine, we'll go back home. So some of them went back home, some of them went over to the Buckman Tavern which was still there and waited. Lord Percy and 800 troops left Boston for Concord and about 4.30 they rang the bell again. There was about 60 of them that came back I guess 20 of them decided they weren't coming, but it's like, no. And they set up right down here, so we're gonna go down to the middle of the green and tell the rest of the story. There was about 800 and about 60, so we need about 10 boys. Now also we need two or three uh, moms to go right over here. The moms and the townspeople were all standing around watching what was going on. And so they were off to the side a little bit. And these guys were here. Now these guys, let me just uh, have a couple of them. Okay, so you can be Jonas Parker, the town strongman. He had said, I'm not turning my back. He said, I don't care. I'm not laying down my arm. I'm not turning my back. If they want to fight, they're going to have to fight me. They're going to have to go past me. And he had been bragging for, for weeks and months, perhaps, on what he was going to do, Jonas Parker. Now, we also had John Parker. You want to be John? OK, John Parker was in charge. Jonathan Harrington was a young man. And he, he was not very old. He had a wife and a child. I think the child was, I think, six years old. And that was their house, actually. Same house right there. And they lived in that house. And uh, his wife was watching him and watching what was going on from the door because she didn't want her child out in the way. They were pretty much scared to death because down the way, then, all you come. And you kind of stop down there where the statue was. And their commander, Lord Percy, says, troops, get ready. And so they get their guns ready and they attach their bayonets and all that. And so they're down there. 
and he said, you know, hold your positions. And so they start coming this way. And these were just regular guys. I mean, he had his, his gun that he killed squirrels with. That's all he ever killed. He never killed a man. He never shot at a man. Why would you shoot at a man? You wouldn't. Jonathan was a young guy. He was like 26. Okay, he'd never fought anything. He'd shot at rabbits, maybe. But that's it. He was a good shot. They weren't soldiers. These guys were. So they march on down here a little bit. Captain Percy comes out and he says, disperse you rebels. Lay down your arms. So what happened? No. Nothing. They move down a little closer. Percy comes up. Lay down your arms, rebels. Disperse. Lay down your arms, rebels. Disperse. Good job. No. What happened? No. So he kind of rides uh, back a little bit, and then he comes. He, he rides back a little bit, and then he rides his horse again down here again and says the same thing. <laughs> Lay down your arms, rebels. Disperse. Hey. <laughs> at that point, all the accounts all the accounts say the same thing at that point. They were not gonna lay down their arms. However, they were going to disperse because they weren't going to have a battle here. And so they were going to do that. So they decide at that point to leave. Now, was he gonna leave? No. No, he wasn't gonna leave. Nobody still knows for sure what happened, but somebody shot and it sounded like a pistol. Didn't sound like a rifle. Who's the only people who have pistols? The captains that on the horses. That's the only people who have pistols. Somebody said fire, and they fired upon them. Parker stood here. We had several die. You didn't die, but you had tuberculosis. <laughs> you didn't die later. You died. Austin died. You died. You died. You died. Okay. Okay. You. You're over here. He gets shot. Ah, fall on your knees. Ah. Okay, come and, and bayonet him, Josh. Ah. Now you're dead. Ah. He's dead. Jonathan drags himself over to his porch where his wife was. baby. <laughs> <laughs> He drags himself over there, and she comes. He gets in her arms, and he dies. He dies. Hey, the British at that point had shot these guys, almost all of them in the back. All their wounds were in the back almost, and they were real proud of themselves, and so they did what British do. When they're through the battle, they shout, huzzah. 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 huzzah! We were kind of playing around over there, but can you imagine it really happening? Can you imagine yourself standing up to a huge army, and then your family members being killed, and bayoneted, and your husband dying in your arms. We've not had to do that because somebody did it for us. Pastor Clark, on the anniversary of April 19th, said, by the providence of God, hath he ordained those men to begin the fight for liberty that would eventually spread to all the world. They were ready to do that because it was time to split from Great Britain. It was time to be our own nation. It was time to have the liberties that we needed to become the nation so that we could be all what God had for us. This monument was erected here in 1799, and I would like to read part of it. The contest was long, bloody, and affecting. Righteous heaven approved the solemn appeal. Victory crowned their arms, and the peace liberty and independence of the united states of america was their glorious reward and it started here and we benefit from it we just don't get it the freedoms that we have and again they're being methodically taken away because we choose not to stand up and say no my favorite part of this trip is being with my class i love my class so much and being able to 
<laughs> be able to just be with them out of state, away from all the distractions back in Oklahoma with all of our other friends, being able to just bond on a level that we haven't really bonded before and seeing each other every day, kind of our last shebang all together. And that's so, so much fun. I love every single one of them. I kind of enjoy this place because you can just kind of imagine the British walking down there and all their order coming down here. They broke into thirds when they got to Concord. A third went to the Old South Bridge to make sure nobody came up from behind them. And about a third went over the bridge to go to Colonel Barrett's farm where they thought the cannons were stored and they were stored there. And so what happened is the British came and all went across the bridge. And then uh, a third of them went on over to Barrett's house. Another third of them uh, came back over this direction. The colonists had already come down here and were up over here. And they had been coming from all over the, there was four or 500 of them by this time from like 27 different cities. And now they were coming to help out their fellow men. The British came back across the bridge this way, and so they were on this side, and the colonists on the other side. And the pastor of the church had told them, let us stand our ground. If we die, let us die as heroes. They saw that there was fire in Concord, so they thought they were burning the town down, and they were really upset. And Colonel Barrett, who was in charge, says, will you let them burn the town down? And so they loaded their muskets at that point and were ready to fight. The Minutemen then marched closer to the bridge. The British are coming. A shot rang out, and then we fired. The first forcible aggression to the British. Major Buttrick leaped into the air and shouted, fire, fellow soldiers, for God's sake, fire. That then is the shot heard round the world. This is Bunker Hill Monument in Charleston. We are across the river from Boston, and this was first devised as a diversionary tactic to help get some troops off and into Boston, but it became a major battle. And it was one of the brightest stars at this point in American history, although it was a loss. But what it was, some men came up and they were gonna stop on Bunker Hill and set up a fort. They were gonna dig a fort and try to get the British to think about them while they were doing some other things. And so they went over and they led them in darkness and very quiet, because it was supposed to be a secret and they were gonna build the fort at night. And so they came across and stopped on Bunker Hill and they decided, no, this isn't right. We need to go on closer to the city and closer to the waterfront. And so they came on over here, and of course, this is Breed's Hill. He said, why do they call it Bunker Hill then? I'm not sure. Nobody's sure. It's the Battle of Bunker Hill on Breed's Hill. They were just normal guys, and they were in the Minutemen and all that, and they had decided that this was to be a good thing to do. And it's like, wow, really? You've got numerous ships of the British Navy right there in the water, and they can just bomb us with their huge cannons. Plus, there's thousands of troops just right across in Boston. Why? Because they thought it was the right thing to do. They were tired of being told what to do. They were tired of being said, we, we are going to tax you, but we're not gonna give you any representation. The British government was acting against their own constitution. And they really weren't planning on a major battle here either. But through the night, they dug, they built their little fort, their redoubt, they called it. General Gage and them saw them over here and said, hey, that is ridiculous. We're sending all these troops over here. And they come over and Prescott was here. He was the leader. Dr. Warren came over, he was here. And they said, we are going to stand up and we're gonna fight. And so they were bombing the place. Then the British started coming, they came, and of course they just marched up the hill with all their regalia on. And of course, what was the famous line that was said here? Don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Because the muskets weren't all that great and they didn't have a lot of powder, and they didn't have a lot of shot, and they weren't gonna waste it. And so they marched up and just, you know, killed a bunch of people. And they came again, same thing happened. They said it was just terrible massacre. 
British come again. Now we're out of we're out of powder. We're throwing rocks and everything else, and come with their bayonets and start killing people, and we retreat. I said, well, what's so great about that? Then we had to retreat. The British said, wow. So we've got a huge problem on our hands. If they had good commanders, it says we, we don't have a chance. This hill sat empty until 1825, and a group came to commemorate the laying of the cornerstone. At a big meeting up here, 75,000 to 100,000 people came up here that day, and there were 200 men who fought in the Revolutionary War, and there were 40 of them who fought in the Battle of Bunker Hill. And, of course, they had the orator of the day come. This was in 1825. Who did they get? Daniel Webster. 18 years later, they finished the monument, and they asked the speaker of the day to come and give the oration. Of course, who was that? Daniel Webster. He said, let us feel our personal responsibility to the full extent of our power and influence for the preservation of the principles of civil and religious liberty. He closed by saying this, Then when honored and decrepit age shall lean against the base of this monument, and when troops of ingenious youth shall be gathered around it, and when one shall speak to the other of its objects, its purposes, its construction, and the great and glorious events with which it is connected, there shall rise from every youthful heart the proclamation, Thank God, I also am an American. One of the reasons that the pilgrims came was so they could be a stepping stones for the furtherance of the gospel. There's on Bradford's grave, there's two quotes and you can go look at them later. One of them is in Hebrew and it says, Jehovah is our help. The other one is the one that we have at school and it's in Latin and it says, what your fathers gained with such difficulty, do not so basely relinquish. Is this just a graveyard? It can be to you, but what I'm asking is that somehow you would look underneath and see things with your heart and just instead of your eyes. What you've been given, don't just throw it away. It's not worth it, people. You've got too great a heritage just to throw that away. Your fathers have gained it at much difficulty. Your fathers and your literal fathers, your, your fathers and the fathers of your country, your pilgrim forefathers, those people that have fought in wars and are still doing that to retain our liberties and on and on. It's just, it's, there's too much just to give away. But the basicness of the faith and staying true to the Lord, wow. Don't depart from that. But you gotta make the right choices. Stay true to who you are, who the Lord has called you to be. I, again, your view of history. Was that just an accident? Is it an accident <laughs> that for some reason you're standing on this hill? That you came to Christian heritage? I'd like for you at this point just to pray and pray for yourself that you would be open to what God has for you, whatever that might be. If there was one thing I hope they remember was that they have a heritage as American Christians to help propagate the gospel and restore the nation. Well, I love to do this trip for many reasons. Number one, I, I love being with the young people. This is my 33rd year at Christian Heritage Academy full time. And I love the young people. I love their families. I love truth. And I love sharing the truth about our nation with them. And I'm an exhorter. I love to challenge young people with the truth and challenge them to see God's plan for their life. Well, for me, definitely the highlight of the trip had to be the whale watch. I mean, first of all, I've never been out on the ocean in a boat before, and then just getting to see all the whales out, because I've heard in the past, you know, some people have never seen anything and have been out there for three to four hours, but we saw them jump, we saw, we saw them feeding. 
I mean, we saw additional animals, you know, we saw jellyfish and seals out there, it was pretty awesome. Well, my favorite part was the whale watch and the Holocaust Museum, too. The Holocaust Museum, it was the most sobering experience I've ever had. I walked through and it's just like this curtain of just, I don't know how a human, another human can do that to others. It's, I don't know, it, it really had an impact on me, personally. Well, the trip, they said a few years ago, just rained all the time, it was terrible, and that's what stayed in my head the whole time was, this is my last deal with CHA before graduation, and it's gonna rain, and it's gonna stink really bad. Then it wound up only raining one day this week, and we wound up drying our clothes on the heater in our room, and left the heater on all the time. So when we got back, our room was a sauna. So, you know, it's just been a blast. It really served as a reminder that freedom is not free, that there's a price to pay for the freedom that we have. And thanks to the men and women who stood up so many years ago, we're able to have this great land where we're go, able to go out and look at these things and remember the sacrifices they've made and then apply those own things to our own lives and realize, well, in the difficult times we're in, we need to make a stand for the truth, just like these people did so many years ago. I think for me, it's the people we're with especially when we all get together and we'll sing or we'll have a devotion. Um, my classmates, it's the last trip we'll take together. And there's, some, there's a spiritual bond, I'd say, between all of us. Would you say so? Well, it's gonna make me cry. <laughs> and not just my class, but I'm realizing on this trip how much we're so blessed, our teachers, our administrators, Mr. Holmes, Mr. Clay, you don't find people like this very, very often who really, really love the Lord and care for you. They care for me and Mr. Mr. Holmes walked, he was gonna walk all the way back to Fenway Park with me yesterday to get my flip phone. And we got to the subway, he's walking. You know Mr. Holmes, he, he had cancer, he can barely feel his legs, it's not like, it's easy. But he's perfectly happy with it. We get to the subway and find out that it's an away game. So we have to walk all the way back. I mean, these, these people really care for you. And uh, I guess I, I look at them as role models of what I would like to grow up to be like.